Good afternoon. Good afternoon for those in Africa and to the east of Africa, and good morning for those joining us from America. My name is Edward Dintois from the Faculty of Engineering and Technology at the University of Botswana. I would like to take this moment to welcome you all to this first of a series of public dialogues that will be hosted by the Alliance for African Partnership, AAP. For those who know, the AAP is a collaborative consortium of 10 African universities, Michigan State University, and an African policy think tank called RENAPRI. The AAP was established in, at Michigan State University in the US in the year 2016, in collaboration with 14 thought leaders from Africa, with the goal of co-creating innovative African-led solutions to global challenges. The AAP members are committed to working in equitable partnership to transform lives and address global challenges. Today's dialogue is the first in a series that will be hosted by the AAP this year. These are a continuation of the ongoing AAP dialogue series, which discusses pressing issues related to higher education and global challenges. The theme for today's dialogue is the engaged university, working with policymakers, the private sector, and communities to advance higher education, education transformation. This particular dialogue is co-hosted by the University of Botswana, together with the Southern African Regional Universities Association, Sarua, which is an association of public and private universities in the Southern African community, SADC. We have a, our media partner for this series and they are called University World News, which is, has an impressive global subscription and followership on their various online platforms, uh, such as their website, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, et cetera. Now to the dialogue for today. Now, increasingly universities worldwide have recognized that they must actively engage beyond their campuses and across sectors to append the traditional perception that they are ivory towers that only focus on theory and leave application to others outside those proverbial walls. Or that, they engage in research purely for academic purposes and communicate it amongst themselves via general publications and conferences with very little engagement with the people outside academia. The universities are now seeing themselves as catalysts for positive change in their communities and beyond. The emergence of the Times Higher Education Impact Performance Ranking which assesses universities' contributions towards achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals is evidence of this trend. To ensure that their work in teaching, in learning, in research translates into solutions for global challenges like climate change, poverty reduction, and the global COVID-19 pandemic that we are now experiencing, higher education institutions are finding creative ways to build bridges to policymakers, the private sector and to local communities. African universities have begun to draft plans, policies and structures to increase their engagement with external stakeholders who can benefit from the research conducted at the institution and who can inform educational and research programs. Today's dialogue will examine innovative strategies for African universities to engage across all sectors and the impact these engagements are having on the transformation of the African higher education sector. And uh, now a little bit about the structure of the dialogue today and a bit of housekeeping. 
we have a panel of five esteemed and, and highly eminent personalities, each representing a stakeholder perspective on the subject of today. We shall allow each of them to speak for 10 minutes, after which we will have a question and answer session followed up by a wrap up or a closing session. We have a French interpretation available. If you would like to access it, you can uh, choose the French channel in the interpretation tab that you can find at the bottom of your screen. And if you are using a, a phone or a tablet, you can select your preferred channel, then uh, tap done. Uh, please try to use the question and answer feature to ask panelists questions that will be addressed at the end of, of the dialogue in the Q&A session. Uh, just also to inform you that uh, we are recording this dialogue and the recording will be shared with attendees later. I think with that we can start and that brings us to the first speaker who is going to give us the opening comments for today's dialogue. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Professor David Norris. Uh, he is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Botswana. Professor Norris holds a PhD in animal science, uh, specializing in quantitative genetics and animal breeding from Michigan State University in the USA. He holds a Master of Science degree in animal and forage science from the University of Reading in UK and a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Physics obtained from the University of Botswana. Professor Norris is a highly experienced leader and academic, having served in different capacities in Botswana, in the United States, and in South Africa. Before uh, coming to the University of Botswana, he was Deputy Vice Chancellor responsible for research and innovation at Botswana International University of Science and Technology, before serving at this university, he was director of the School of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at the University of Limpopo in South Africa. He has held a number of key positions at the University of Limpopo, where he joined as senior lecturer and rose through the ranks to full professor. Professor Norris has published extensively in refereed journals and conference proceedings internationally and as a higher education leader, he counts amongst his key interests and competences matters of strategic leadership, multi-stakeholder strategies and processes, as well as change management strategies. Professor Norris will share with us how UB is envisioning itself as an engaged university. He will discuss why this is important and also share with us the experiences of the University of Botswana in developing an engaged an engagement policy. Professor Norris. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Professor Dintoa. Thank you for that introduction. Let me just start by saying that we are gathering at a time when not only universities, but also national economies and entire continental alignments are daily taking stock of their situations, looking for ways to offset damage to their lives, to secure what is best about their societies and to replan their futures with limited predictions and diminished resources. Our friends in Europe and England have mainly experienced this kind of condition in the circumstance of war. And despite the severity of their wars, they did achieve periods of stability, growth and affluence at times of peace. Now, these dominant powers have used their regional traditions and long-standing institutions as centers of gravity to reorient, to reorientate themselves and define their new normals. From the perspective of Botswana, 
these cycles of crisis and recovery can seem unusual. But of course in Botswana, Botswana has lived under the shadow of the pandemic and its economic and social costs, just like every other country today. But this is the second time in living memory that we have nationally mobilized to fight an epidemic and we shape many of our current practices of the state and market inside the recovery from HIV. We have therefore lived in that normal, in that new normal uh, for 20 years. Now, despite being a country with good natural resources and high human capital, we're not spared the severity of the global, uh, of the global economy events of 2008, because that new normal was counting upon higher rates of foreign direct investment. When this was impossible to solicit, we went ahead and built the new institutions that our recovery and growth policy of the time required and realigned them into pipelines for accelerating a human capital-based economy. This new infrastructure of the new normal was itself disrupted by what can only be politely be described as a spillover of the negative influence from beyond our borders. And this in turn forced us to quickly reshape our public service and reform the nature of our markets. I'm mentioning these things, colleagues, because I want to dispel the myth of Botswana as some kind of some outlier Wakanda magically thriving above the storm clouds of neocolonialism, uh, economic subversion, state capture, and crippling economies, and crippling epidemics, I'm, I meant to say. We lie in the same bed as every country in the world today, and therefore we are constantly reassessing the roots of our re re resilience. The emergence of Botswana from the COVID-19 pandemic and associated economic depression requires institutions of higher learning, such as the University of Botswana, to step forward and play a meaningful role on Botswana's economic recovery. UB is a fully, that is the University of Botswana, is a fully indigenous knowledge institution that has fueled the nation's unprecedented growth, democracy, stability, through the expertise of the public service administration, the civil society, and our professionals since independence in 1966. It is the only university established by direct popular civic demand to deliver to national progress beyond the limitations of uh, colonial universities throughout Africa. Therefore, UB is the closest single entity which is, the, which is most representative of Botswana's cap capability and therefore most ready to convene the concerted effort of all the existing national drivers of economic growth. The 2008 Excellence Strategy, which was designed to push Botswana from the effects of global economic crash and the subsequent reduced foreign direct investment had called for centers of excellence, hubs and clusters as the tools for achieving the desired high income status of the nation. Now, as part of the public service book, University of Botswana is positioning to be a model state owned enterprise that can immediately underpin the quick emergence of the required centers of excellence, hubs and clusters in line with the new strategy. The focus of these principles will be to accelerate and diversify sectors in the priority areas of health, food, media, creative industries, and, edu and education. And this in unison with the national expertise policies, budgets, investment capital, industry, and other sectors. The University of Botswana is advancing its strategic intent of creating stakeholder value by converting its expertise and resources into centers of excellence that can host hubs 
and manage national clusters towards accelerating and diversifying Botswana's economy or Botswana's exportable and inclusive human capital-based uh, economy. Specifically, the University of Botswana is currently mobilizing and catalyzing Botswana's knowledge base that lies in its intact communities and excellent institutions into the productive resources for recovery, growth, and employment. And this being done towards achieving the non-negotiable outcomes of vision, the country's vision 2020, 2036, and which are meaningful inclusion, rapid diversification, and export orientation. Now, Botswana's 2036 vision, which is also dubbed Achieving Prosperity for All, aims to transform Botswana from a middle-income country to a high-income country by 2036. Now, central to this vision is a transition from a national resource mineral-dependent economy to a knowledge-based economy. If successful by 2036, Botswana will no longer be recognized as a country dependent on its di diamond endowments, but as a country renowned for the creation, transforming, sharing, and using knowledge to create a new globally competitive, diversified export-oriented, sustainable economy with healthy, educated, prosperous, and happy citizens employed in high value jobs. Now, to be specific, the University of Botswana has forged an advanced partnerships to derive value, which is also exportable to the Sadek region. We've engaged with Botswana Public Service College to professionalize the public service along the path to Vision 2036 and transition to the knowledge economy. We are working with national, the non-governmental organizations to package solutions for civil society sustainability, inclusive national consultations on relevant referenda across and decentralization processes. We are working with the investor community to plan and de-risk a growth path to Vision 2036. And this by recapitalizing growth through investing on centers of excellence, hubs and clusters for emergence of new human capital economy sectors. We are working with universities such as the University of Toronto and the Combral Health Management in Finland to establish models of investable wall-to-wall -wall national health system and value chains and advanced locally derived medical products and services. We are working with our rural communities. We are working with our villages in collaboration with Canada and Finland to apply tools for smartening villages through public management efficiencies towards increased local opportunities and revenue generation. We're working with Botswana-owned media and IT companies to develop systems for managing the education sector, lifelong learning and skills content, co-developed and authenticated by the University of Botswana. We are working with the creative industry, uh, media environment to gear Botswana to package new investable broadcasting and production skills applicable for SADC wide demand following the anticipated uh, and mandatory digital migration. A key feature of the best higher education system in the world I'm sorry about that. I'm changing my battery. Wow. Apologies. Glitch. Just a second, please. Sorry, uh, director of ceremonies. Now, a key feature of the best higher education system in the world is the close link with its national objective of sustainable and balanced social and economic development. Now, creating an environment in which higher education and the economy can symbiotically address the needs of a knowledge economy is fundamentally crucial. It is this close compact between the higher education sector and the national agenda 
that has shared the thinking of the University of Botswana's new strategy. Now, central to our strategy is the critical need for the university to enhance economic and societal engagement and impact. This requires the University of Botswana as a key player in the higher education system to not only be responsive to the needs and expectation of society, but also to deliberately and proactively shape and significantly influence the issues which are central to the national agenda. This necessitates, this necessitates the university to have an understanding of the external environment and the changes in society that are altered in the context in which it operates. The university therefore intends to play a key strategic goal or role in the development of the knowledge economy and the transformation of Botswana into a knowledge society through the development of an active, productive, impactful and strategic network of national, African and global collaborations and partnerships. Now, unlike in the past, today's economies and global integration require a more educated and skilled workforce. Knowledge creation and management, information and communication technology, research and development are therefore highly valued. Industries that are competitive and profitable are those that innovate and invest in technology and a more skilled workforce. Universities cannot lag behind. They are challenged to remain relevant by innovating and providing the talent that industry demands, as well as generate the knowledge that industry requires to remain competitive in a global economy. As I conclude, the University of Botswana uh, new strategy is being launched at a time when Botswana is undergoing a period of profound change and transformation with a new destination of high income status being chartered by 2036. Now, as the country positions itself to a transition from a natural resource to a knowledge-based economy, the University of Botswana has never been in a better strategic position to grasp the opportunities that are on offer. The demands that the university is required to respond to include the need for the country to be globally competitive in terms of product services and skills to promote wealth creation through decent jobs for its citizens to enjoy a better quality of life through societal improvement and to embed knowledge and innovation at the core of everything we do. This requires a university that is broad, that is broad and comprehensive in scope and importantly, engaged. Creating a future for the knowledge economy, which is the UB strategic theme has been developed to deliver on these commitments and to proactively respond to the new and emerging demands of Botswana's transformation agenda. The strategy explicitly positions the university at the apex of the tertiary education system as a comprehensive and engaged research-based university recognized nationally and internationally for its focus on quality and excellence, creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship. The focus of this strategy is therefore to ensure that the University of Botswana is an engaged university with strong industry and community links contributing to the economic and social development of the nation. Thank you, uh, Director of Ceremonies. Thank you, colleagues. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Norris, uh, for those eliminating words. I think uh, uh, we will be able to engage with Professor Norris uh, at the end of in the question and answer session, as I have already said. So with that, I think we will just move on to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is uh, going to be Professor Don J. Jerry. He is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Mauritius and which is a member of Sarua. Professor Jerry was appointed Vice Chancellor of the University of Mauritius in March, 2017. He is championing the vision of a research engaged and entrepreneurial working, university working in close partnership 
with the public and private sectors, as well as with the community to foster innovation. He is putting a lot of emphasis on organizing research at the university around the sustainable development goals and is leading various initiatives to develop human, intellectual, business, and social capital through an inclusive and openness approach. Under his leadership, the University of Mauritius has championed the concept of international education diplomacy and built a strong partnership with universities worldwide. From 2012 to 2017, he held the post of National Research Chair in Biomaterials and Drug Delivery under the Mauritius Research Council while heading the Center for Biomedical and Biomaterials Research, a center attached to the University of Mauritius, which he founded. Prof. Dury studied at Bordeaux University in France and received his PhD in polymer chemistry in 1992. He joined the Department of Chemistry at the University of Mauritius as lecturer and was appointed professor in 2005. He has received various national and international awards and recognitions. Professor Dury will talk to us about some examples of effective strategies for engaging external stakeholders with a particular focus on community engagement. He will also illustrate how the strategies have reshaped his institution. Professor Dury. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dintua. Um, uh, I, am, uh, I should thank uh, Dr. Jamieson for inviting me to this first public dialogue series of the AAP. Uh, I'm uh, uh, excited to uh, you know, uh, share with you uh, some of the actions that we put in place, actions and also uh, strategies at the university uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, public engagements, uh, in terms of uh, industry engagement. So uh, as the time is very limited, uh, I should uh, move on immediately to my first slide uh, in uh, this presentation. And uh, uh, so uh, can you move to the first slide, please? Well, to the next slide. Uh, yes, you, if you can click again. Thank you. Um, so uh, we all agree that universities and uh, uh, these days are facing a lot of challenges. We are very far from uh, the concept of, of the modern universities, if I may say so, uh, that was coined by Alexander von Humboldt, uh, where we were focusing on uh, research and, and teaching and learning. Uh, we uh, see that universities face problems like disruption, digital transformation, uh, socially, uh, they have to uh, be socially engaged. Uh, they have to develop multi, uh, multilateral partnerships. Uh, they have to also open themselves. So a lot of, trans um, a lot of uh, challenges. And amidst all those challenges, uh, there is something important, transformation transformation of universities becomes a must. So uh, we can see, next slide, uh, we can see worldwide uh, that uh, a number of uh, initiatives are being put in place uh, to uh, change the whole setting of universities, uh, whether we talk of living labs or we talk of civic universities. Uh, one common thing in all of those initiatives is that we should address real world problems we should look for uh, sustainability, and also we should connect, uh, you know, the local uh, city uh, with also uh, the local community, and also go from local to regional to global. That is uh, what we find in all those concepts. One common thread. Uh, uh, before I, I, I get into uh, what we've done at the university in terms of strategies and so on, uh, uh, next slide. I would like to share with you. Uh, some quick facts about the University of Mauritius. Uh, and uh, so the university was created in 1965. Uh, we've got seven faculties, six centers, uh, a thousand staff with two, about 300 academic staff uh, and a student population of 10,000. So uh, next slide, uh, next and next. Yeah, 
next one. So uh, to talk to you about some of the strategies that we've put in place, uh, uh, I'd like just to show this, uh, uh, this slide about uh, uh, the vision that I coined when I joined as VC in 2017. And that vision was uh, uh, to put innovation in the center of what we do at the university. And to say that uh, uh, we no longer should view the university as the, in the center of the marketplace. And universities, the, the role of universities is, uh, is to respond uh, you know, to the needs of, of the country, of the region, and, and not to exist because we are, uh, we are an institution. So getting the university to work with government, uh, un, uh, with industry and the civil society through, res through research and in entrepreneurial activities uh, is extremely important because that is the way we can show impact, we can demonstrate impact, whether economic, whether uh, environmental, whether social, whatever. Uh, we, we, uh, we think that uh, uh, this is the way uh, we, we should move forward. Now, uh, when, next slide. When we talk about uh, uh, putting, you know, uh, uh, getting to impact, of course, how do we translate that? Uh, we are no longer restricted to producing uh, the, the human capital through teaching and learning, uh, nor are we restricted to the intellectual capital through research and innovation, but we also look towards the business capital and the social capital, interacting with industry and with the civil society. Uh, next slide. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the strategy, we see that uh, it's important to uh, have a clear strategy and sustainability uh, is uh, a, a focused uh, way of, uh, you know, uh, of getting our actions and, and getting things moving in the direction of uh, working with the stakeholders. And uh, we can see that uh, uh, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, offer to us uh, an incredible, uh, I mean, um, an amazing uh, uh, action framework for transformation and impact. Next slide. So uh, wh when we talk of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the SDGs, we should realize that uh, it is this is central to the SDGs, partnership. Partnership is key to championing the SDGs. And I have uh, done some, you know, some kind of mapping of, of looking at uh, how much of the target, how many of the targets of the SDGs uh, are under the umbrella of each uh, stakeholder. Uh, when, we, when, when I talk of government, I talk of university, I talk of industry, of course, in there, embedded in there is the civil society. We can't do anything without the civil society. So you find that uh, while government champions about 50% of the targets, uh, working uh, at the interface of uh, with the university and with industry, we can achieve something like 47% of the targets. So that is a huge amount. So we've mapped uh, at the University of Mauritius our, uh, our um, uh, uh, activities in the SDGs in terms of uh, you know, what we can do uh, at the interface. And we see uh, it's uh, the model uh, that we have produced is exactly what we're doing at the university. We do much more when we work in close relationship with either the uh, with either the government or with industry so that is something very important and more importantly we do much more when we work in a, a tripartite matter next slide please so in terms of the strategies that we have put in place uh, it's uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to to delve into all of them but uh, one 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 of them that is very important in most universities we tend to do uh, research uh, from a bottom up approach which is more or less academic led. We have put in place at the University of Mauritius also a top-down approach, uh, which is uh, more multidisciplinary, uh, more based on national uh, priority uh, 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 research projects. And this top-down approach uh, is championed uh, by the senior management that will identify uh, the kind of areas that we can work on. And those areas are defined here. Uh, so we, we have defined posts of research excellence, posts of innovation, we prioritize research. And this is extremely helpful in moving the SDG agenda. Next slide. Uh, next and next. Uh, so uh, 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 in terms of, uh, uh, next, next slide. I, I will give you some examples of uh, uh, what we've done in terms of working with the government. So, uh, no, uh, you can come back to the previous one, please. Uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, partnership with the government, 
uh, we have, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, we have set up, for example, uh, with the Ministry of Environment Research Environment Observatory at the University of Mauritius, we've set up uh, with the Ministry of Land Transport and Light Trail, uh, a road safety observatory, again, at the University of Mauritius. And all those are, are uh, addressing specific targets and SDGs. Uh, uh, in terms of, you know, of stewardship, uh, we're working closely with the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and we produced a roadmap for the ministry uh, to look at, uh, uh, you know, at modernizing our health sector, and the university is leading on that. So uh, it's again, uh, you know, a very concrete example of how we can impact on SDG three, for example. Next slide. Uh, uh, working closely uh, uh, also with the government, we can achieve uh, a lot on SDG five. Uh, and SDG 5, as you know, is gender, uh, 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 gender equality, a very important topic uh, for our part of the world. So uh, there also our uh, staff are very closely working with the government in, in developing policies, in, in, in developing laws, and in doing a very close analysis. Next slide. Uh, we also, uh, 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 as I said, work with industry. And working with industry uh, is also very important because uh, I just give you two examples of what we're doing, uh, but, but there are numerous examples. Uh, during the, the COVID pandemic, our researchers uh, came up with a, a nanotech mask, and it's a mask uh, uh, that is 99.5% uh, uh, effective against viruses. So. Uh, totally antiviral mask. And this mask has been developed by our researchers in close collaboration with a textile company, Artinits in Mauritius. So uh, this responds to uh, SDGs with another company, which is uh, 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 one of the top companies in Mauritius in the automobile sector. We're working in the field of battery management systems. And uh, so uh, again, uh, you know, addressing uh, renewable energy uh, problems. So these are typical examples where we are adding value through working within uh, with with industry. Next slide. Uh, but not only uh, you know through working with industry in terms of research and innovation, but we can also work with industry in terms of deep, uh, of developing. Uh, teaching programs. We've developed with uh, one IT company, uh, which is Accenture, uh, 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 you know, joint master's programs in applied software technologies and business enterprise uh, uh, resource planning. With another IT company, we've set up an innovation lab on campus. And, and that is very important. You know, four years ago, five years ago, people were saying, it's crazy. We will never get companies to invest uh, at the university. Uh, that will never happen. And it's happening. Uh, and uh, through an innovation lab, uh, we are addressing a lot of things and, you know, uh, upgrading uh, the skills of our students. Next slide. Uh, we also, uh, you know, working very closely with industry into developing in university industry clusters. So there are five clusters that have been put up at the university since a year now, and people are working closely with, with industry, not on blue sky research, but on responding specifically to industry's needs. So that is also uh, uh, something very interesting, and we respond to target 8.4 of the SDGs. Next slide. Uh, I picked up uh, two examples of uh, how we uh, we can work in a tripartite manner with government, industry, and the university. So uh, at the university, uh, about four years ago, we have set up an agritech park, and uh, this is about 21 acres of land where we're looking into the development of modern agriculture, uh, be it biotechnology, be it uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 developing smart agriculture, like for example, digital agriculture, addressing food security. So all these respond to SDG 2 and to target 2.4 uh, uh, more, more uh, precisely. We can work also uh, in uh, you know, the quadruple helix model in developing social entrepreneurship. Uh, this is something very important, empowering women uh, you know, to, to, uh, to, to get into uh, entrepreneurial activities, developing micro and small businesses are, are things that are very important. Uh, so uh, uh, coming to the last uh, uh, part of the question that was, uh, uh, that was said to me, uh, how all, so uh, the next slide, how all we have put in place uh, is helping reshaping our university and, and in what ways? Well, I, I will say that uh, in so doing, 
we have opened the university. We have taken the university off the center of the marketplace. Openness of the university is very important. Uh, we now seen as the privileged partner for government and, in, and, you know, and industry to impact at the national level. We, are we have a leading stewardship role in many uh, areas. Uh, and, and also very importantly, uh, you know, it gives us a sense of purpose into what we're doing in, in kind of responding to the national priorities and focusing on the sustainable development goals. And for our students and staff, uh, you know, this is this is a great, uh, great opportunities because, uh, you know, this not only enhances the skills of our, of our, of our students, but get our staff involved in real, uh, you know, in real projects where they can impact and also brings funding to the university and enhances the competitiveness of the university. So, uh, uh, you know, in a nutshell, in about 10 minutes, that's uh, uh, what I could say about working together uh, with the stakeholders. And I will end up with uh, one last quote, uh, which I think is very important. So next slide. And, and the quote is, uh, uh, is uh, it's not about competition. Uh, we tend to often to, you know, to go to rankings and so on. But I think it's about impacting locally and contributing to uh, global betterment. So uh, uh, this is the message that I will pass on to you all uh, uh, at, this, at this important meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Dury, for that uh, very exciting uh, uh, presentation, highlighting all those uh, initiatives from the University of Mauritius. Uh, I think uh, definitely uh, the, the attendees will come back to you in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we will right away go on to the next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Levis. Enea. Dr. Enea currently serves as the Director of Higher Education in Malawi's Ministry of Education. He's a mathematician with a background in education, and he obtained a PhD in mathematics from Humboldt University in Berlin, Germany in 2010. Previously, he served as the Dean of the Faculty of Science at Chancellor College uh, of the University of Malawi where he was also a member of the University Senate and has served as president of the Southern Africa Mathematical Sciences Association, which is a SADC organization for promoting mathematics in the region. Dr. Enea's fields of research interest are optimization, mathematical modeling, strengthening mathematics teaching, and learning through problem solving. He has worked on developing efficient optimization methods for minimizing energy functionals, infectious diseases modeling, transport optimization, and logistics in value chain analysis. Also in optimization of transport networks in cities. Dr. Enea will talk to us about how government and higher education institutions mutually benefit from close engagement. He will answer what are the examples of effective strategies for strengthening this relationship and what tangible impacts could be achieved from that. Uh, Dr. Enea. Um, Edward, I'm sorry to interrupt you. This is Amy Jameson. I've just got a note that uh, Rahmat has to leave at 10 a.m. hard stop. So would it be possible for her to go uh, just before Dr. Nea? Dr. Nea, my apologies to you. Is that, is that okay for you? That's okay. That's all right for me. Okay. Thank uh, you so excellent. much. So uh, uh, yes, if you could switch to, uh, Justin, if you could switch the slides and, and Rahmat uh, could come in. Thank you so much. I apologize. Uh, Excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you, Dr. Enea, for that consideration. Yes, we will uh, give uh, the opportunity to Rahmat Ayin Fonjoyo. Uh, I apologize if I don't spell uh, uh, pronounce that very well. Rahmat's work focuses on business development and capacity building for SMEs in Africa, agriculture, and food landscapes. She is passionate about hunger alleviation, SME growth, 
youth in agriculture, sustainability, innovation startups, and community development. She's based in Lagos, Nigeria, and has spent the last half a decade implementing key agriculture projects in the country, providing operational support for a tech startup in Northern Nigeria, supporting farmers on a cocoa sustainability project across Southwest Nigeria, and developing and implementing a business plan for a pioneer early generation seed enterprise in Ibadan, Nigeria. In 2019, Rahmat co-founded Now Reaching Africa, where she is currently the co-CEO in charge of the company's Agri SME membership hub engagement and driving business operations. Before her work with Nourishing Africa, Rahmat was senior business analyst at Sahel Consulting Agriculture and Nutrition Limited. She's an academic uh, with a background in agronomy with a specialization in soil science and land resources management from the Obafemi Awoloyo University in Nigeria. She will discuss how both the private sector and higher education institutions can mutually benefit from close engagement. She will talk to us about examples of some effective strategies for strengthening this relationship and the tangible impacts that could be derived. Rahmat. Are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear and see me clearly? Yes, yes. Go on. All right. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to uh, be invited to speak at this event, and it's a pleasure to connect with you all. I will go straight into the presentation. I will be talking about uh, the engaged university, how the universities can work with the private sector to advance African higher education and transformation. As I've been introduced, I'm Rahmat in Fiji, I'm co-CEO at Nourishing Africa. And what else isn't on my bio is that I, um, until recently, uh, led the uh, corporate shared value aspect of the Sahel Group. Uh, Nourishing Africa is part of the Sahel Group, a sister company to this group. And the corporate shared value aspect of this engage youth, uh, young, young scholars, as in the universities um, with a focus on introducing them into the career sector effective today. We can go on, please. Next slide. So I would start by um, examining the ad, ad facts that we have. I don't know if it is my internet. Okay, yes, the slide is moving. So I have two um, different graphs on the left and right side of this slide. So first, we have seen an uptake in the number of young people who have enrolled in tertiary universities. And these have been on an upward climb since 1970. In fact, between 2000 and 2010, it was a double climb. But then on the right hand side, the employment, the young people in employment and education as in Africa as compared to the rest of the world is critically low. We, are also, we have also seen in Nigeria that the graduate unemployment rate is up to 23% for those with undergraduate degrees. And then research carried out in Nigeria in particular that significant I've shown the significant schemes mismatch between what is displayed in terms of skills related to it. So there is obviously if people enrolled in universities in tertiary education, why do we have this skills gap, this talent gap, this unemployability for graduates in Africa? Next slide, please. I think I will. Okay, I think I have a slide. So my
So I will just use that. So how can the private sector, how can private sector engagement leads to transformation in Africa and pipeline three critical strategies or Can you hear me? Yeah, I saw a few Yeah, yeah, we you are bringing a bit. We can hear you. All right. So the first thing I would mention when talking about the role of tertiary institutions and how we can engage with the private sector, the first thing really is to improve the quality of the thought courses. And this is related to how the curricula can actually be improved to ensure that these students are developing employability skills, they're developing soft skills right from the universities. I have heard um, Professor Danje, I hope I pronounced that correctly. I was so excited when you mentioned what the University of Mauritius does at, uh, at their university in terms of ensuring entrepreneurship, research and innovation, and tying all of these into the academia. This is a very critical and important issue. So the first point really that we focus on and that we tend to engage uh, with the universities is an approach to improve the quality of the taught courses. So I think I would take my video off to ensure that I have better bandwidth. I, I hope my voice comes up clearer at this point. And the role of the private sector in this is to engage in updating teaching the teaching curriculum and implementing course delivery. So we have seen met, you know, we have seen case studies of this work across board. I'll take an example um, here in Nigeria where we have the Lagos Business School um, that where we have seen that they have bring, brought in the private sector to teach courses, to even design the curricula, not just to teach courses, but to design the curricula. And this helps to bring in the private sector, the industry perspective into the curriculum and even into the course delivery. So at that preliminary stage, it is very clear that the students are learning to excel in the industry, to launch successful careers in the industry, not just the theoretical aspect. The second point here is to provide a broader learning experience for students. And this is a critical role that uh, universities must simply play. And when we bring in the private sector, so into this, we see that there is a lot of engagement and quality work placements. Students need to go beyond the four, uh, the four corners of their classrooms to actually have active and real life work experience. And we've seen cases in Nigeria and a few other universities uh, where we've worked across Africa, where students in agriculture, for example, um, conceptually agriculture as holes and core classes and this agriculture is beyond that but giving them the out of classroom experiences through internships through fellowships even while still in the universities help to broaden their scope and learning experiences and give them a soft landing into the industry as a 20. The third point here is to ensure targeted availability input. The university has a critical role to play in this and this simply means that the universities are actively and conscientiously providing information on suitable career opportunities for each course, for each taught course. So it is not just about you know, learning, uh, I don't know, design, um, designing product, designing a school or web development. The practical application of that in the industry must be taught as well. And this can be achieved by partners with private sector to organize job fairs, workshops, leadership sessions, and programs to ensure that the reality of what is out there is well matched with what is taught in the classrooms. And uh, moving on, I would use um, the Sahel Scholars Program as a case study very quickly to showcase what the Sahel does. So um, like I mentioned earlier, Nourishing Africa is a sister company to 
Sahel Consulting and another company called Sahel Capital. And together, these three companies are referred to as Sahel, essentially. So the Sahel Scholars Program is an annual program introduced in 2017 to, with the aim to empower Nigerian students. And in 2021, we have extended this program to um, the entire African continent. And our aim is to ensure that these students are introduced early on into their careers, into um, the entrepreneurial, into the leadership aspect of building successful careers. And we leverage three comp critical components for this. A conference, because we understand that we have to nurture and grow skills and employ, um, skills and mentoring in the space at a broader level. Internship and mentoring, um, bringing them to the organizations to, to, be, um, to be mentored and to participate in the internship. And lastly, through scholarships to incentivize their growth and performance. The impacts uh, to date are just very quickly. Uh, we've been able to reach um, six universities here in Nigeria. I mentioned recent, that we recently launched that out uh, to other universities across Africa just this year. We've held eight physical conferences. We've um, had 10 scholars intern with the company. Uh, we've had over 10 volunteer placements. And we've been able to reach more than, we've been able to reach thousands of uh, conference participants, as well as held two virtual conferences. And this model, we've, we've seen that by mentoring, by coaching, and by bringing them out of the classroom to have real-time experience. They, these internship programs last between six weeks to um, eight weeks. We've seen that even this two-month period out of the classroom, learning within organizations, learning from top minds and professionals, help them to gain experiences beyond what they had ever imagined that their course would be. And on the next slide, I've just put some testimonials obtained directly from the students because we have seen that this on the next slide if you can go to the next slide please so i would leave you to be the judge of this because the feedback actually speaks for itself and so i would round up by saying that for true transformation to happen in the landscape african universities must simply partner with the industry with the private sector to first provide and implement practical curricula that addresses the need of employers this is absolutely critical in the design stage, in the in implementation stage, in teaching the curricula, the private sector must be involved. Then it is important to provide a broad range of out of classroom experiences. So not only involves in internship and mentoring, but there are other opportunities to actually bring the students out of the classroom and into the industry to begin to learn the uh, critical skills that they need to um, excel. Another point is to provide leadership and employability programs um, through a very variety of opportunities, trainings, jobs fair, and such. And lastly, it is important to create and share resources with young scholars and professionals. There are so many resources out there from books to data to publications, not just on the academia or research, but more towards entrepreneurship, leadership, or, or employability, and how to successfully launch uh, their careers in the private sector and out of the private sector. And I think it is really important that the university actively begin to contribute to curating and sharing these opportunities with the university community. Thank you so much uh, for the honor. I will stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed. Uh, I think we will now go back to to take Dr. Enea, if he is there. Yes, I'm here, uh, Professor Ditra. Yes, Thank you so much. Um, I ahead. was already introduced. I guess I can go. I can go straight into the. Yes, please. Oh. to uh, talk to you the benefit from our close engagement and um, any effective strategies 
for strengthening this kind of uh, relationship. It's obvious that there's a mutual beneficial relationship between governments and uh, higher education institutions. To begin with, um, as you all know, uh, all international and national development uh, blueprints, such as, for instance, the SDGs, the African Agenda 2063, the Science, Technology, and Innovation Strategy for Africa, the so-called STISA 2024. And in Malawi, we do have our own um, development blueprint, uh, Malawi 2063. And indeed, all other national development plans and policies, they do call upon trend capital human development in order for these uh, plans to be implemented. And therein, the role of uh, higher education institutions comes into play. Universities do play a, a crucial role in developing the much needed human capital, a critical resource that any government must have in right measure and distribution across key, if not all areas of the economy, if it is to succeed in anything that it plans to do. This is what, uh, for example, uh, in Malawi, the previous three major high education projects have tried to achieve. So far, the three main projects that the government of Malawi has tried to implement in the higher education institutions are, we've had the Higher Education Science and Technology, uh, the so-called HEST project, This was funded by and, um, the, in major public uh, higher education institutions. We also have had uh, another project called Skills Development Project. This was funded by the World Bank. Again, it was partly a loan and partly a grant. And right now we are implementing another project called Skills for a Vibrant Economy, save in, in, in short. All these projects are designed in order for the Malawi government to build required capacity in terms of human capital to implement the projects, to implement the plans that the government has. Secondly, while governments uh, set policy directions, they rely on higher education institutions this could be public and private to implement the same policies. You know, sometimes this comes even after the higher education institutions have provided technical expertise in the formulations of this. Uh, uh, of these policies. For instance, again, I'll draw a development plan. And we do have um, others um, like the um, uh, in the higher in the, in the education sector. Uh, we, we do have um, the education plan uh, that we are also implementing for 2020 to 2030. Uh, uh, and in all these plans, the higher education institutions are encouraged to cascade these plans into the courses that they are teaching, and indeed into all the uh, programs that they are offering. There, therefore, you see that there is a very close relationship in terms of the policy that government is setting in place, but also as to how and who are to be involved in the implementation. Sometimes even these institutions, if they do not implement or if they do not terror their programs into these policies, they can also even lose our funding because specific funding would be tailored towards specific goals. And therefore, that's a strong collaboration that is there between the government and the institutions in terms of policy formulation and policy implementation. The third relationship that uh, comes to mind relates to funding. Funding is an obligation that governments uh, have for the higher education institutions 
to carry out their mandates of teaching, research, consultancy, and outreach. And when the universities receive uh, this, they must do um, implement whilst they are responding to the government's uh, policies and in line with the de uh, development plans, some of which uh, they do emanate from government's uh, manifestos. So when governments are coming into, uh, into, into, or when political parties are coming into governments, they do make manifestos, they do have plans that they want to achieve, and this can only be implemented through the policies that they uh, bring in. And how do they implement them? They implement them by making sure that they involve the higher education institutions. In this case, the higher education institutions are regarded as implementers of the government's uh, policies and um, the promises that the uh, various uh, political parties make uh, to the people uh, when they are being voted into power. So there we do have um, a very strong relationship again uh, between the government and the higher education institution. Furthermore, and um, perhaps this is one of the most um, um, notable uh, traditional relationship uh, between government and institutions, which relates to the knowledge. Here, I'm talking about knowledge generation, knowledge dissemination, and knowledge preservation. Historically, uh, universities have been the main generators of knowledge, generation of knowledge for its own sake, or indeed for its application now or later. This application is to solve uh, problems facing humankind. And this is why um, governments, including the government of Malawi, actually fund all types of research. This was the case uh, recently uh, when the Malawi government, uh, through the Ministry of uh, Education and through the Directorate of uh, Higher Education, um, they did fund uh, 50 researchers drawn from public uh, universities. And the topics of research that they were doing uh, actually were diverse because we know they'll be able to generate knowledge, they'll be able to impact, they'll be able to answer to some of the problems that are facing uh, humankind. In fact, examples do abound in science when certain knowledge that appeared at the beginning to be just for mere uh, academic purposes, but it became useful much later in history. I am sure that we are aware of uh, many of these. I can take uh, or draw an example from Albert Einstein's theory of uh, relativ relativity, you see, uh, which is now being used uh, for space exploration by launching spaceships and so on. But at the beginning, perhaps it was just academic. But you see the knowledge that has been generated is now finding uh, its important use um, in history. And the dissemination and preservation of knowledge by higher education institutions, this is of course their traditional business that they are doing uh, every day. And therefore um, we see again, a very strong relationship there. I can go on and on, but I want to turn to um, the effective ways uh, or strategies for strengthening this kind of uh, uh, relationship and um, the, the tangible impacts that could, do, uh, could be achieved. I would like to say that uh, in this regard, the first and perhaps the foremost strategy is for governments to have continuous engagement with the higher education and um, uh, research institutions. Here, I can cite uh, examples of um, regional forums that have provided good committee of 10 heads uh, of state and government, the so-called uh, C10, that uh, champions science, technology, and innovation. I can also cite the AU NEPAD uh, Calistas Juma initiative. I can also cite uh, the building in agriculture, uh, the so-called RU forum. And in fact, talking about Roo Forum, we do have a very strong relationship with Roo Forum because we've been associated as a country with Roo Forum from its inception. And there are quite a number of projects that have been funded, um, including training of faculty uh, through the Roo Forum. 
And recently, Ruforum uh, did recognize the president of Malawi, His Excellency Dr. Lazarus Makasei Chakwera, as Chakwera. This is actually coming out as part of this kind of engagement from the law uh, standing relationship that has existed. Secondly, uh, governments uh, must continue to involve higher education institutions in policy formulation and implementation as part of their mandate of teaching, research, consultancy, and community engagement or outreach. Now, talking about community engagement, there are perhaps no clear answers as to the question of who the community is, while engagement itself is the partnership of university knowledge and resources with those of the public and private sectors to enrich scholarship, research, and creative um, activity, thereby enhancing curriculum, teaching, and learning. And also, this does prepare uh, educated and engaged uh, citizens. This strengthens democratic values and civic responsibility and addresses critical societal issues and contribute to the public good. Engaging communities as participants has a double um, advantage of uh, generating knowledge and disseminating the same knowledge and uh, implementing policies at the same time. Knowledge that is co-produced and uh, applied to real challenges to human development and sustainability offers pathways and solutions that would otherwise not exist. And therefore, the community engagement that governments do make um, are very critical in terms of um, um, the policy um, uh, formulation and policy dissemination and implementation. Again, the other strategy that um, the Malawi government is um, um, implementing is the establishment uh, of centers of excellence and centers of specialization and as you uh, all know, this is being championed also by the SADC heads of state and, and government. And recently, um, we do have in Malawi, for instance, a number of uh, uh, these ex centers of excellence. We have, for instance, uh, Aquafish at the Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources, specializing in fish. And again, we do have um, the um, African Center of Excellence um, in public health and herbal medicine at the Gamuzu University of uh, uh, Health Sciences. These are examples uh, of um, uh, centers of excellence in key areas of the economy. And we are establishing more centers of excellence in areas of economy, including um, agriculture, mining, education, science, and, and technology. This is one example of making sure that there is uh, effective engagement. Another strategy is um, uh, drawing up memorandum of understanding and um, specific drawing specific uh, policies. And in here, I can uh, cite an example uh, of um, um, the university industry collaboration policy that the Ministry of Education uh, through the Department of uh, Higher Education, uh, where I am, uh, is developing at the moment in cross consultation with the universities as well as industry. We think that with universities and the, um, uh, um, the industries collaborating, facilitated by the policy from the ministry side, will go a long way in terms of um, achieving more um, on, the, on the ground. And this will also provide a chance for our students to, to be engaged right from our college until they are finished. Another strategy is uh, integrating uh, faculty uh, in government boards and other important uh, committees. Again, here I can actually cite um, examples, including my own. Before I joined the ministry, I was assigned to be a member of the board of Malawi Bureau of Standards. And there are several other boards where technical expertise from faculty members is needed. And so what the government does is to uh, also put technical expertise from universities into some specific uh, boards. And that's one example of uh, um, strategy for uh, engagement. Again, the other strategy is uh, strengthening the um, uh, quality assurance systems and accreditation bodies, such as the National Council 
uh, for higher education uh, in the case of Malawi. And through funding to uh, the National Council for Higher Education and the National Council for Higher Education impacting in terms of quality to the institutions, it remains a case that the institutions remain engaged uh, with the uh, ministry and with the government through uh, the Council for uh, Higher Education. And lastly, I would like to mention the issue of awards, grants, and um, uh, research funds that the government uh, does provide and other uh, academic undertakings that the government does um, uh, do in collaboration with uh, the universities. These are some of the strategies that are going with, to, to go a long way in terms of uh, making sure that there is a, an engagement, always an engagement between the government and um, uh, the universities. So in short, I would like to say that uh, um, the government and higher education institutions, there is a mutual benefit uh, when they uh, collaborate uh, closely and uh, there are effective strategies, which I have outlined in the talk, that are going to strengthen this kind of a relationship. And if we implement them uh, as we are doing, we think that we are on the right track in terms of uh, uh, remaining engaged with uh, the university. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Enea, for, for that. Uh, maybe just a little bit apology to the attendees and the panelists that we are running short of time and we will probably overshoot uh, the, the time that we thought we, we needed. I hope uh, all of you can still uh, remain with us for at least another 10 or so minutes uh, at the end. But uh, I would like to right away bring in the, the last panelist. And this is going to be Dr. Pinky Mekwe. Uh, Dr. Mekwe is uh, International Ideas Senior Regional Advisor for Africa and West Africa. And her work focuses on strengthening programmatic and administrative coherence and performance. Uh, before coming to International Idea, she has worked as Executive Director of Internationalism at University of Johannesburg in South Africa. She has worked as Deputy Director of the International Office of International Education and Partnerships here at the University of Botswana. Uh, and she has also worked as a visiting researcher at the uh, FETS Institute of Social and Economic Research in South Africa. Uh, Dr. Mekwe will discuss how both civil society organizations and higher education institutions can mutually benefit from close engagement. She will talk about examples of some effective strategies for strengthening that relationship and the tangible impacts that can, come, can be achieved there. Uh, Dr. Mekwe, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> oh. Right. I disappeared. My connection is also a little bit wavy. So if I should uh, disappear, it'll be because I see that it is going down, but I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for giving me this audience. I'm going to quickly run through first um, what it means to me to talk about Africa's university and engagement. I'll try to define the engaged university, at least from my perspective and experience, but also from observation of some universities doing this work of engagedness. I'll talk to you uh, from that particular point of view then about actualizing engagedness, looking at some of the vehicles that have been used. And then I'll quickly try to push in the civil society angle right there at the end. And I hope I won't um, take up too much time in, in, in doing this at the same time that I won't uh, do injustice, particularly to the angle um, of civil society. Now, Africa's universities, um, um, insofar as I'm concerned, really have a long history of engagement and engagedness, right from setup to 
what has then developed into uh, performance indicators. We would recall, for instance, that a lot of our universities started off as land-grant universities linked to their partners abroad. So they were always engaged and there always was a vision as to why the university was being set up often to address issues of poverty or of developing um, the agricultural sector so that there would be food, for instance. So it wasn't just about education. We, could, we would also recall that universities also sought to, at the very beginning, um, directly inform, educate, and network to transform regional communities here, if you think, for instance, about my career at university, that's what it was doing. It was really positioned as a West Africa, sorry, an East Africa university. For West Africa, think of Sheikh Hunter Diop in Senegal, arguably um, the biggest university in Africa to date. And even before that, Fura Bay um, in Sierra Leone in, in West Africa, this one with a bent, particularly to the diaspora community. We could also think in terms of um, the role that universities played with respect to political activism, particularly in the 70s. Think, for instance, about University of Dar es Salaam, um, really the center for Pan-African thought and conversation. Two faculties bent on decolonization efforts, such as English departments at um, Ibadan University, for instance, and then later that movement went over to Kenya, to Kenyatta University, among others. So if you think um, in terms of uh, pro-democracy, a lot of the, the, those scholars that were taking on their governments particularly in the 70s and holding government to account. We're coming out of universities. And so we saw um, in the late 70s, a lot of those um, scholars having to leave and go into exile. That I would suggest is what engagedness was and always meant where universities in Africa were concerned. And so when much later with the management of universities, we would see that in African universities, often you would be called upon to not only offer research, you would have to also teach, but there would always be that, that component, community engagement. It was not surprising. The notion then of the engaged university in Africa, I'm suggesting as we understand it now, and as we discuss it, is perhaps a broader, perhaps more deliberate, perhaps more open to scrutiny set of steps to more effectively deliver on its key foundation points and the performance indicators of teaching, research, and community engagement. To try then to define the engaged university, I think we've already heard a lot about what an engaged university looks like. In my view, the engaged university ought to be development oriented. That means that it needs to be needs aware at both the local and global level. It needs to be both a responsive and to also do anticipatory work, meaning that it pays attention to its human resources, to its researchers, to its scholars, to its students with a view to ensuring that it nurtures ethical, empathetic global citizens. I believe the engaged university ought to be international in character. That means that it has to have a student population that is international in character. The faculty and support staff should also be international, inclusive. The curriculum should be international. And this it's important because it leads to international fluency of culture, of languages, of difference and of commonalities that cut across spatial, racial, language and generational differences. 
a university that has these two characteristics would be very good. It would be a very good basis for engagedness. But I believe there's a third component to the university being defined as engaged. I believe it ought to be globally connected. It needs not only be aware, but also and not only be aware of the global issues, the big issues of the day, but be an active participant with the global community, um, loosely speaking. And um, with respect to these issues, it should engage with formal global structures. I've been trying to avoid using engaged, engaged, but they engage with formal global structures, UN, the RECS, the AU, for instance, but also the informal global structures, whether it be um, advocacy groups or cultural groups. It should be concerned with causes that affect specific communities outside of its own territory. It could be um, the LGBTQ communities, um, wherever there might be social injustice or a need to assist one way or the other, you know, to transform for the better um, citizenry across the world. And so it ought to be alive to causes that affect humanity at large. The engaged university then needs to be awake to the needs of humanity and it ought to seek to create impactful difference and positive transformation in the lives of citizens. Now, how to actualize engagedness? I'm going to very quickly talk to some vehicles and how some universities have actually um, used them. The vehicular models for affecting, for effecting engagedness may be university conceived. So they may come directly out of the university. The university might develop them. The university might even run these. Maybe a, a, a vehicle that is co-conceived with a partner that might be a university, might not be a university. We've heard about industry, for instance. We've also heard a bit about communities. And these could also be co-run, co-developed, sometimes also co-funded. It could also be, and this is an interesting one that has been developing on the continent of Africa, that an entity is actually independent of the university, but is anchored within the university in partnership and becomes then a bridge between the university and the broader, the broader community. Some of these vehicles, when we talk about how they actually act, actualize, um, would be in the form of, for instance, dedicated centers. We've seen, for instance, the University of the West Indies, Jose. Um, it has developed as one of its centers, uh, the UWI Reparations Center. This is a successful global lobbying center for reparations for slavery. It is built on a bedrock of extensive research and community collaboration. We've seen also that, that the vice chancellor and some members of uh, the, the, the scholarship community there engage directly um, with organizations such as CARICOM so that the voices that come out of research get to be heard at policy level. Another vehicle could be a policy school. And we've seen this effected at Nanyang Technological University, NTU, one of the leading universities in the world in Singapore. It has built a robust government school that serves Asia and, and, and lays specific emphasis on developing civil servants if I'm allowed to say that, um, for Singapore and China. It could be that um, a university decides to create a niche expert training facility. And we've seen something of this nature 
in Taiwan, where the Taipei Medical University offers specialized training in the management of medical facilities for the whole region. So literally teaching countries how to manage health. And this would be something that I believe right now would be important to do um, because COVID-19 has also um, thrown into um, particular focus the importance of management of facilities across the world. Sometimes this comes, these vehicles come in the form of research teams. Sometimes they are loose research teams. Um, for example, in South Africa, we have seen um, VUT, Val University of Technology, and I believe Stellenbosch uh, University research teams coming together um, towards reading the Hartipier Sport Dam of hyacinth um, in order that this would not negatively affect the economy, uh, the tourist sector, and therefore the economy of the country. Similarly, UWI researchers have also done um, work of this nature where they have put together a Caribbean islands team to tackle sagasam seaweed and when that became a problem um, over there. There are many of these examples. I want to pay a little bit more attention to what I call community initiatives, where you have volunteerism at the heart of the team, if you like. Um, and also you might have research teams that link up with the university as well as link up with the community. These are the examples that I will speak to. First, in the establishment of ANOVA, which led to the growth and establishment of its offshoot, what is called AROPSA. The Africa, no, the Association for Research on Civil Society Organizations in Africa, uh, of which I'm a board member and have really been invited to come and speak um, while wearing that particular hat. So very quickly then, civil society is in my view, a critical partner, an essential building block of any notion of development. And we have already indicated that a key defining feature of the engaged university is that it ought to be development oriented. ANOVA, um, when I look at what has worked or is working, is an interdisciplinary community um, that is anchored at Indiana University at uh, the Lilly School of Philanthropy. It's dedicated to fostering through research and education, the creation, application, and dissemination of knowledge on nonprofit organizations, philanthropy, civil society, and voluntary action. Now, I speak to ANOVA not to talk too long about it, really because ANOVA is the precursor of AROXA. AROXA uh, developed out of engagements with ANOVA, where it was um, decided that it would be important to create something similar on the African continent. And so AROXA sits at the nexus point between academic research and civil society organizations. AROXA works around networking, working with researchers, linking them with civil society organizations, supporting and facilitating research that informs the work of civil society organizations. We also do research about civil society organizations in order to make it available so that other civil society organizations can learn, civil society organizations can learn from one another and other entities um, that would be interested in such work would also have access um, to work about civil society organizations. But we also keen on supporting 
reflections that enlighten, enrich, empower, and facilitate the management of civil society organizations. And here, there's offer of fellowships, um, particularly to leaders within civil society organizations, in order that they would be able to transition and build um, structures that would ensure that civil society organizations live on. We know a lot of organizations come up, they do good work and they run out of funds or something, there's a problem and then they die off. The idea is to ensure that we develop a global community of enablers with immediate CSO reach. So this is what happens um, with AROXA. And I believe it is, it is working. AROXA hasn't been in existence for more than seven years now, um, but already we have seen an offshoot from that in the development of a philanthropy research center at the University of the Witwatersrand that is actually run by um, the current chairperson of Aroxa. I think that's one example that actually works and is doing impactful work. The other one that is an excellent example of university CSO engagement that's also close to my heart is the Africa Health Research Initiative. ARI, as it is called, is partnered with UKZ and the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, and has various international partners and researchers. It also has international funders. This is an example of an entity that was formed outside of the university and came to sit within the university in order that the researchers would be able to work collaboratively with UKZ and um, scholars and researchers to do important health work, health research that would also be interventionist in character. What the researchers do is to focus on um, two key areas of health research that are very important in the area and also in Africa. These are HIV and uh, tuberculosis. And so the community, the ARI has two separate um, uh, seats, if you like. One in Durban at the university where you have the facilities uh, for research, the labs, and also within the community that it seeks to serve in some Kelly. An interesting aspect of the management of ARI is that it has what is called the Som Kele Community Advisory Board. This is a board that allows for open dialogue with the community, making the community not just subjects of research, but active participants. So symbiotic in nature, the relationship offers building blocks to ethical, scientific and scientific quality, relevance, and acceptability, um, according to Ari. The communities educate the research teams about the community, about self, the culture, traditions, community norms, and protocols. The researchers in turn educate the research teams about, uh, educate the community about the different phases of the research, the ethical rights of the participants, <clears throat> and seek to offer solutions um, to the problems um, of the communities as the research is ongoing. They also thresh out important issues, including potential risks and burdens for participants um, and host communities. So keeping these conversations alive and ongoing with a view to offering necessary, often pertinent intervention means that this is one of those um, initiatives that I think is successful, but is also future-proof. And so finally, for me, an avidly engaged university is one that is owned by all. It demonstrates relevance. 
is responsive, is anticipatory, is future-proof, is not afraid of volatility, challenge, and change, rises to it, in fact, and instills confidence in its members, its community, and the world at large. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Robert. I think, yes, we, we have come to the end of the, 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 the presentation by the panelists. I will spare just a little bit of time for a few questions to the panelists. Uh, the first one, if Professor Norris is still there, uh, it says, uh, Professor Norris, great presentation, very passionate about sending the university to the people and people to the university. I would appreciate getting a few challenges the university has faced in its endeavor to engage policymakers, private sector, and communities. Uh, is Professor Norris there? Yes, sir, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, let me respond respond to it. Actually, let me say this, we've not really had challenges. The question that has been posed to us is where have you been? Because we've been waiting for you. Where have you been as the university? Across all stakeholders, the policymakers, the private sector, and, uh, and the community. What is important for us is to orient our own stuff to say, this is how we should work going forward. How are we relevant to society? How are we impactful uh, with whatever we do as an institution of higher learning? That's the critical thing. Is for us as a university to now move out of our shell and spread our wings and work with all these stakeholders that have been uh, uh, patiently waiting for us. So really the challenge is on our side to learn how to engage and engage better. The, the, the stakeholders, they are ready for us, they're excited and they're embracing that we are now coming out to talk to them, to work with them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Before you go, maybe just one more for you again. Uh, yes. It says, our universities struggle with student participation and commitment due to our top-down structures. How can we enhance gendered student engagement in policy formulation and implementation? I would say this, that it starts with the way we teach, innovative teaching method. One of the things that I'm passionate about and I believe in is what we call PBL, problem-based learning. Because when you teach, you teach the teaching and learning in that format, you start engaging students to critically think to solve problems, real problems that are out there in society. So problem-based learning for me is the starting point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, and I will move on to Professor Dury. Maybe a couple of questions for you again. The first one says, uh, the University of Mauritius working together in saving communities what, uh, how are these initiatives funded? That's one. Uh, I take, uh, yeah, uh, I can take it. Uh, I mean, uh, when you go uh, and talk to the government, uh, you need to go and offer them something. And, and government is not uh, willing to look into blue sky research, right? Uh, so that's why I insisted on the SDGs because the SDGs are concrete things we can do. And, and government knows that it cannot do everything on its own. So we can bring expertise. Now, we go to the government. We know that we have a, a, you know, an acute problem of road accidents and road safety in our country. And we say to government, we can help you into addressing the problem because it is a lot of research to be conducted into uh, you know, behavior of, of, of our people, into uh, how we drive, et cetera. So when we say that to government, then the discussion starts and we say, okay, uh, it's important that we put up a road safety observatory. Now, if we put that, we say to government, uh, we, can, we can do that, but if you inject uh, funding into, so then we put a proposal 
and the proposal goes to the Minister of Finance. And uh, as it is a good thing, they put in funds. Uh, when, I, uh, when I started you know, with the Agritech Park, I put up a proposal. I said to the government, you want to group entrepreneurs. You want to develop modern agriculture. We've got 21 acres of land. I want to transform that into an agri-tech park. And I'm requesting funding from you. And they gave me 15 million. So, uh, you know, this is the language uh, we, go, we need to go. This is what I call openness. If we stay in our ivory tower and think when it will come to us, it won't work. When you go to industry, what industry says to you? What can you offer to them? Right. If you go to them, you must be offering something. So what do you offer to industry? So if you go and say to industry, we can offer, we can do publications and so on. I mean, they will not, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, adapt to you. And, and they want concrete things. Uh, like, for example, I take the example again of the mask. Uh, we say to, uh, if we say to industry, uh, we want to develop that. We have expertise. This is our idea of how we want to develop the mask. We have worked in the field of, uh, let's say, nanotechnology, and we can set up a membrane, uh, etc. Then uh, industry says, I mean, these guys know what they're talking. So they put in money again, right? Uh, so this is the way we're driving things. We don't have money at the university. Uh, well, we do uh, from time to time, uh, uh, you know, do things like uh, through the matching funds, we bring some money on the table, uh, but it's not huge amounts. Uh, so this is also what we're doing. Uh, one of the way of also, uh, you know, attracting university to us is, uh, you know, putting specialized labs. This is what we've been doing at the university, putting an AI and robotics lab, putting a GIS lab, uh, you know, so when you have those kind of labs, uh, and industry sees that uh, they, they cannot, on their own, put so many things uh, you know, uh, in place, they will come to you. So they need to see the advantage that they get. And once they're convinced, they put money. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, uh, very elaborate uh, answer. One more for you before I let you go. Uh, Poverty in Africa is still a huge concern. And uh, your top of top down approach to solving emerging concerns makes me wonder where those for whom these interventions are meant uh, for. Don't you think the people should genuinely be at the center of universities concern? Are SDGs just good on paper? I hope you can get that one day. Well, uh, uh, to, uh, to whom I'm talking, I'm talking to everybody. I'm talking to the researchers, I'm talking to the heads of universities, I'm talking to the government, I'm talking to industry, uh, I'm talking to, to you know, anybody who'd listen. Uh, and, uh, and the approach of you know, that top-down approach is not something that I have invented. Uh, I mean, I did it differently, but uh, you know, this, these are things that are being done in Singapore, for example, which is uh, you know, a, 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 a top-notch country in the Southeast Asia. Uh, so we, we uh, base ourselves on models that have worked elsewhere. And when we see that, for example, in, in Singapore, universities are doing their bit, but they also have EA triple star, uh, you know, that is addressing concrete problems. Uh, I, I put it in the form of, you know, uh, either, uh, for example, commissioned research or for, for uh, or research that address uh, national priorities. Uh, so these are things that uh, that we need to also uh, look into. Um, uh, that, that's why I say uh, publication is important. Uh, you know, we need publication to, to show that uh, we have the abilities, we have the competencies, but then we have to go a step further. We have to transform all this into concrete uh, action and concrete results. And I see, uh, you know, concrete results in working and make no mistake. The, when we talk of national problems, when we talk of uh, uh, all those problems that we face, uh, when we talk of the SDGs, we're not talking of individual problems. We're talking of multidisciplinary problems. You can't address renewable energy problems just by having uh, electrical engineers or mechanical engineers there. You, you need social people as well. So that's a new way of looking at things in our universities. So 
uh, uh, if you want to address poverty, are you only looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, at uh, 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 giving to the pool money or, uh, you know, uh, finding schemes? No, you need to work with them. Uh, so these are things that we that we try to do. Uh, uh, one thing that I shared this morning, I was uh, giving a talk also on uh, uh, at the um, uh, Agence Universitaire de la Francophonie, you know, the French, uh, the Francophone Association of Universities. And I was talking about uh, one important thing that universities could do uh, and, and getting them closer to the society. Uh, SDG4, which is about quality education, says that universities should provide uh, citizenship education to all its students. Uh, can we think of universities sitting together in the southern part of the world at regional level, coming up with uh, a sort of a curriculum with a program that addresses citizenship? Uh, and, and if we could do that using technology, not looking at, uh, at, at you know at uh, at uh, you know money gains, uh, but just doing it for the people. I think we'll have done something great, and we will have something that we can show to the world that that being in the south, we can have original ideas, uh, we can do things uh, that are really concrete and change uh, society. So uh, this is this is I truly believe in the SDGs, and so that's what uh, probably I'm too passionate about it. And uh, but I, I I I sincerely believe that it can it can change the face of the world. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof, for the, those uh, impassioned answers. Uh, I'm just going to take one more question because we have uh, seriously uh, run out of time. And uh, this last question, I will address it to Dr. Enega, if he's still there. Uh, it says, what principles, guidelines, framework underlies a transformation curriculum in our African HCIs? Dr. Enega, are you there? Yes, I, I'm here. Can you come again on the question, especially what? the last part? What principles, guidelines, or framework underlies a transformation curriculum in our African Higher Education Institute? I, I would say that the uh, first and foremost principle in um, curriculum uh, in our institutions should do be which African countries. If we are moving towards uh, industrialization and so on, we must actually review our curriculum in that regard. I think it's no longer time to uh, be teaching about the longest river in Africa being Nile. That's, that's important knowledge, but not very useful. I would say that we should look at the knowledge economy that we are talking about, and therefore uh, we should tailor our curriculum um, it, with regard to um, uh, those developments. That's what I would say. So before any university um, has uh, uh, reviewed their curriculum, let's look at uh, exactly what we want to uh, achieve um, in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Enega. I think at this point, I'm going to give a chance to my colleague, Dr. Nico Juste, to give us a wrap up of uh, the dialogue today and uh, some concluding uh, and closing remarks there. Nico, if you are there, can you do that for us? Thank you. Um, thank you very much, colleagues. Um, um, it was quite a intense discussion from different uh, viewpoints. And I think we need to congratulate all the panelists for their um, insightful comments and insights around the whole notion of an engaged university, especially in an African environment. Um, we only have a few minutes and, and, and in the few minutes that's remaining, I don't want to summarize what everybody said, but perhaps just highlight what I do think we need to take away from here. Um, firstly, um, I fully agree with Professor Jury um, around the SDGs and their importance. But I, as much as the SDGs 
can't be really separated and seg and, and, and see in, 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 um, uh, as individual SDGs making a difference. The entangled notion and nature of the SDGs um, makes them uh, un, uh, in a way that uh, uh, um, presents them in such a way that we need to look at them as a whole, firstly. But secondly, we can't take the existence of a university and see it separate from its entangledness with society. And the society we talk about is the broader society, which includes government, it includes um, um, civil society, it includes um, the, 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 um, uh, all the organizations that Pinky spoke about. The, um, the, the university of the future is that university that is fully engaged. But one thing that I do think, and, and, and uh, Dr. Mekwe did um, highlight that, and I think I want to reiterate it. The university's role is uh, defined by its connectedness um, uh, with the global environment and how it um, would clearly translate the, translate the local and the global. Um, that's the engagement of the university of the future. But then uh, in, in conclusion, uh, I think we as universities must understand that the only way that we can really make an impact is if we do it jointly. I think gone are the days that universities can actually um, engage with the problems of the day. And we all know the current problem, um, COVID. Um, if we didn't engage with the problem that with COVID um, in a um, in a way that we collaborated with each other, I don't think we would have even made a dent. Because if you if you look at the research that was done to find the the vaccines, it wasn't done in isolation. It wasn't somebody sitting in a in a isolated space doing it. So engagement for universities of today means um, how it translates the global to the local, but importantly. And um, the Professor Norris clearly illustrated that uh, what UB will be doing and is doing. And that's also taking indigenous knowledge and translate the indigenous knowledge to the global. Um, if, we, if we do not do the, this comprehensively, that means see our engagement as a comprehensive exercise. We need to not to duplicate what we've done so badly in the past as universities, and that is live in our silos and think we can make an impact. Um, we can go all about why universities hey, haven't made such an impact globally. Um, but one of our biggest, um, um, one of the reasons why we haven't was because we haven't found the, 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 the way to collaborate but also individually exist. And I think that's the challenge for the future. I found the, the, the arguments very sound. Um, the, the, it's, it's for Sarua a, a privilege to be in this space because that's exactly what we try to do. Sarua is trying to position the, it itself as a digital collaborative, collaborative space where we can find answers for the future. But the engaged uh, institution is the institution that will find the right mix between its individual needs and, and, and societal needs and collaborative needs. So thank you very much for having us in this space and for organizing such an, an um, exciting and uh, informative uh, discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nico, for that. And that uh, brings us to the end of our dialogue. And I want to thank uh, first all the panelists uh, for the very insightful uh, ideas that have been shared and discussed today. Uh, and all the attendees, it has been a very uh, uh, engaged, <laughs> engaged uh, 
dialogue. Uh, you have sent in a lot of uh, questions and you have been chatting in, in, the, in the chat uh, feature there. Uh, unfortunately, we also had a, a very tight time to work with and uh, not all of your questions could be put forward, but I think we have uh, tried to, to get as much as we could from the, the dialogue uh, this afternoon or this morning. Uh, I think that's, uh, that should be the end there. Our next dialogue will be uh, on Wednesday, 27th of October, as you can see there on the screen. And when it is uh, announced, I think you can already uh, start joining so that we come back to meet in October. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh,